Okay, so let's keep talking about conservation biology and the causes of extinction. As we talked about in the first part of phase two, habitat, habitat loss, habitat destruction, alteration, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Habitat is the number one thing. You know, again, that's that challenge. If you lose your habitat to live in, whether it's been removed or it's changed or altered, it's tough to keep going as a species. So that's like one big body blow that you take when you lose your habitat. Sometimes you can relocate, you can adjust and adapt, but most of the time they go extinct. Uh, the second issue we were discussing was this introduced or alien species, non-native species moving in or getting introduced into ecosystems that they shouldn't be in. So we left off with the carp issue. Those carp were brought here to help with a specific problem. They got out. Now they're destroying the ecosystem. We do this all the time. Throughout human history, we've done this. We've intentionally brought things over. We've also accidentally had things introduced into new ecosystems. So what I want you guys to do is do a little research and find an invasive species in Illinois that is creating havoc on the Illinois ecosystem. How did it get here? What is the ecological niche? And how is it impacting everything in the ecosystem? So you know, carp, their ecological niche, this variety, they are herbivores. They eat algae. They eat phytoplankton. So they're with no predators to control them. They wipe out all the food. They outcompete the natives that serve the same ecological niche and they go into extinction. Native predators have not evolved ways to hunt these things. You know, species evolve together over millions of years and they learn predator prey relationships. You throw a new one at them, they don't know what to do. So, okay, so let's take a look at, in the plant world, honeysuckle. So this is a great picture of an Illinois forest. Early spring, the trees haven't leafed out yet, but you notice all that greenery towards the ground. That's all honeysuckle. Honeysuckle was brought here intentionally to help control erosion. Wow, this plant grows super fast. It spreads like crazy. We can put it on hillsides and it'll control the erosion of the soil and prevent soil erosion. Fantastic. The problem is we can't control it. You can't control honeysuckle. It is a huge task to try to go out and clear a forest of honeysuckle. You go in, you take a chainsaw or hand pruners, you cut the stems, and you have to poison it immediately. If you don't, it comes back, and it's mad, and it sprouts up like this big, crazy, angry bush, and just goes nuts with new growth after it's been attacked, after it's been cut, or if something eats it, deer nibble on it. It sprouts up and just gets very, very big quickly. That's its response to predation. So the problem here is when this honeysuckle germinates or leaves out in the early spring, none of the native plants, I'm going to change color here, are ready to germinate. You know, your oak trees, your hickories, your maples, those little seedlings, they're not ready to germinate in February or March when honeysuckle can start. So those seeds are sitting dormant. They're waiting. The honeysuckle's growing over the top of them. Now, March, April rolls around and the oak says, oh, it's warm enough, I'm gonna germinate. It germinates, it sticks its head out of the soil and it says, oh, I'm in the shade. I can't survive if I'm in the shade and it dies. So the new generation of oaks and maples and hickories and all of our native plants don't have a chance to germinate and survive. 
because the honeysuckle blocks them out. It outcompetes them. Huge problem. This is destroying the forests of Illinois. It, not just Illinois, the Midwest. Illinois, Indiana, Missouri, etc. So drive around, and when you see green in early March, that's usually honeysuckle. <clears throat> and then it stays green until sometimes December. Everybody else in the forest has gone to sleep in November. Honeysuckle is still green and photosynthesizing. It's a huge issue. Uh, for those of you marine biologists, <clears throat> check this out. This is some of the work I'm doing down in Belize with lionfish research. Uh, another huge invasive issue. These fish got introduced off the coast of Florida accidentally, intentionally. Nobody's completely sure. It's estimated six to eight fish got into the ocean. And now they are rated as the worst ecological disaster in the Caribbean. Just decimating the entire Caribbean and eastern coast of the United States ecosystem. They eat everything. Nothing eats them. They have very few predators in their native environment. They're Indo-Pacific, Indonesia, Malaysia. It's where these are naturally found. Fish over there know how to eat them. In the Caribbean, our predators have never seen these things. They don't know what to do with them. So they leave them alone, and that leads to exponential population growth. A lionfish can produce tens of thousands of eggs, and their population explodes. So how do we get rid of it? That's part of our conservation plan discussion further on. Uh, so there are huge consequences of introduced species. There have been over 50,000 introduced into the United States, some of them intentional, others unintentional. Billions and billions and billions of dollars in economic costs. And even human health, West Nile, that disease got brought here because of an introduced mosquito that came from Hawaii. So... Huge problems, huge health issues, huge economic issues when we deal with introduced species. So, all right, pollution. All right. Oh, let me make some room. So pollution, inorganic changes to the environment that lead to health issues. Air pollution, water pollution, trash, etc. This is all on us. We do this. When we're burning coal to make electricity, mercury gets emitted. Mercury goes into the environment and it ripples throughout the ecosystem and it winds up in the ocean it winds up in polar bears have mercury in their body because of the pollution we produce as humans yeah, it's just one more body blow to species when we pollute the environment so can we find ways to minimize our pollution we're not going to stop it that's the reality we can't stop it but can we decrease it and is there enough natural systems out there to detoxify these pollutants nature has ways of doing it but we've overloaded nature that's the problem there's just not enough natural ecosystems to detoxify the volume of pollution humans are producing okay uh, another one to mention here over exploitation When we over-harvest a resource, it leads to population decline. Nope. It's worse. We catch too many fish. There's not enough females in the population to rebuild. We harvest too many this, too many of that. Prehistoric humans were doing this when they drove those mammoths over to cliffs. They over-exploited. 
100 million sharks a year are killed for fins to make soup. Sharks are apex predators, type 1 species for the most part. Some of them only have one or two offspring. Huge ecological issue here when you remove the apex predator from an ecosystem. It's not sustainable to kill that many sharks a year. Can we change culture? So there's a thing known as the extinction vortex that I'll mention here. When you have a population that is big, <clears throat> it's easy to harvest. And there's so big population on this side. The dollar value of that individual or those species, those, that species, is very low because there's so many. But what starts happening, if you start over harvesting, the population gets smaller and smaller and smaller. <clears throat> so as your population is going down, the value goes up. So there's more incentive to go out and harvest more incentive to collect because they're worth more and then that drives the population down further because it's worth more wow there's only 20 of these left in the world i want one i'll pay 2.7 million dollars somebody's going to go and get you that whatever it is that cat that fish that plant that whatever so the extinction vortex when a species is caught in it it is very difficult to pull them out of the vortex Otherwise, they keep going, and eventually they go extinct. Um, so sharks are moving into that vortex. So are lots of other species. So our concern is when we screw around with the keystone species, what kind of consequence does that have to the health of the ecosystem? So jaguars are a keystone species of the rainforest. So and if you hit the hyperlink, that's some of the work I'm doing in Belize with the Jaguar research. Jaguars need large, large ranges going all the way from, it used to be in the United States, but from southern Mexico all the way down through South America. They need this continuous range for genetic diversity for their population. They're a type one species, K strategic reproduction strategy. You know, they need huge territories. Those territories have been chopped up. They've been destroyed. They've been fragmented. They've been altered. The cats have been hunted. The cats have been over harvested. The cats have been poisoned. All sorts of things going against these poor animals. And it's led to their population declining dramatically. Now, as populations decline, we have huge concerns about genetic variability. When your population goes down, this is going to hopefully throw you guys back to evolution. The population starts going through a thing known as genetic drift. Specifically, the bottleneck effect. You lose genetic diversity. That is not good in any population. You lack genetic diversity, you're less likely to survive environmental changes, you have lower fitness. Big problem, huge problem when your populations get too small. Even if you can rebound and rebuild the population, it may not recover because the genetic diversity isn't there. Uh, Illinois example. Prairie chickens. We used to have prairie chickens all across the Midwest. But their crashes, their population crashed because of agriculture. So Illinois population crashed, and what they saw was this genetic diversity declined and just crashed. And they had horrible reproductive rates. The babies wouldn't hatch out because there was no genetic variability and the population was terrible. We reintroduced prairie chickens from other populations outside of Illinois, increased genetic variation, hatching rates shot up. Still trying to rebuild the population, 
but it shows genetic diversity is important. All right, we'll get into endangered in the next lecture.